From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Since its establishment in 2015, the new development bank, the NDB, also known as the BRICS Bank, has endeavored to cater to the socioeconomic development and environmental protection needs of its member states. Now, as part of its new general strategy, the NDB will work towards aligning its new operations within the Paris Agreement. It says it aims to direct 40% of its total financing over the 2022 through 2026 period to projects contributing to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Today in our Beijing studio, we have the honor of having Leslie Mastorp, the NDB's Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, to discuss the bank's overall strategies and beyond. Leslie, so good to have you. Welcome to Beijing and to our studio. Thanks for having me. Leslie, we know there have been a number of uh, national and multilateral development banks out there. What are the current priorities for the new development bank under your leadership? So July 2023 marks a very important month for us because it's the occasion of our eighth anniversary. So the bank is still in institutional terms a very young institution. We're still in elementary school, if you like, in the life of an institution. But over these last eight years, the bank have established itself as a truly new global addition to the MDB uh, world. Firstly, we have completed or approved up to $35 billion of new infrastructure projects. Uh, that represents uh, 99 projects spread throughout the BRICS uh, countries. So from a zero start, a complete startup in 2015, to almost 100 projects today, that is a significant uh, achievement. The second major achievement, I would say, over this period is that we have deepened the focus of our member countries' infrastructure uh, priorities in a sustainability uh, sense. So all of our projects, as you've just uh, flagged, we aim to have almost half of our projects going forward is going to have a green and sustainable focus, meaning it will be focused on the climate uh, agenda. And then thirdly, the bank has uh, specialized in developing its local currency offerings, meaning we raise funding in the local currency of our member countries and then on lend in the uh, local uh, currency. Going forward, I would say one of the key priorities is new membership, expanding the global footprint of the bank to become a truly global institution of emerging markets. You're talking about uh, new investments and new projects. Uh, Juma Rousseff, the new head of the organization, recently during a speech said that, that the NDB will, quote unquote, fund a greater share of projects in local currencies. Uh, what is the rationale behind? Can you elaborate? Sure. So right from the outset in 2015, the bank set out to um, deepen a local currency of financing. Now, when you lend to countries as a bank in US dollars, US dollars is where the deepest pools of liquidity resides, meaning uh, because it's a global reserve currency, you can raise dollars at the cheapest level because there's a large uh, number of institutional investors you can raise money uh, from. Each of our member countries, China, for example, has a bond market the size of its economy. China has an $18 trillion economy. Its bond market is slightly bigger uh, than that. So there's sufficient resources in China, in the financial and capital markets, which can be tapped into for the development of infrastructure. So let's take China alone. In China, almost half of the projects that we are financing are in renminbi. So the Chinese yuan is one of our most developed local currency markets, and we have raised uh, now 40 billion renminbi over the last eight years. That money has gone into the financing of you know, rooftop solar projects in Shanghai, uh, offshore wind projects, uh, financing of, of airports, rail projects, and so on. We now want to reproduce that local currency strategy in the other member countries, in South Africa, in India, in Brazil, and, and so on. So we're helping the countries to diversify so that they don't only borrow in US dollars, but they also deepen their own capital markets. Mm -hmm. It's a more efficient way of financing infrastructure. You know, Leslie, there have been a whole lot of talk about the de-dollarization, or at least the initial process of it. Uh, but you look at some facts on the ground, uh, like we have been just talking about, uh, only some 4% of Forex uh, was reserved in RMB, whereas over 60% or so was still in US dollars. If you got global trade, it's a similar picture, over what 80, 90% of global trade uh, by one measure or the other was still conducted in US dollars. Uh, how do you look at this process of you know, having 
uh, RMB as, as a more dominant uh, currency and uh, less U.S. dollars and less risks, therefore, of U.S. dollars there, thereafter. So way back in 2009, uh, the then governor of PBOC, Governor Zhou Sichuan, he wrote a policy paper around the internationalization of the RMB. So that's almost 14 years ago. So already at that stage, Chinese policymakers have committed itself towards the internationalization of the, of the renminbi. Over the last 14 years, uh, there's been a rapid growth in the renminbi as a currency of trade, as a currency of settlement, um, but as a reserve currency, it still represents a small portion of the total global uh, allocation. In 2016, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, included the renminbi as part of what's called the special drawing rights, which is a basket of global currencies the US dollar is the dominant one, the euro, uh, Japanese yen, um, and the British pound. So the, the renminbi is now an official reserve currency in the sense that a central bank in Peru or Colombia or South Africa, they can take some of their foreign exchange reserves and put it in renminbi. That is going to continue and the renminbi will become, will be used more as a currency of trade. And already, as you know, a number of countries have announced China, Brazil, China, India, that they will settle some of their trade in uh, local uh, currency. So the direction of travel is towards greater use of local currencies, especially the renminbi. And talking about the priorities of the New Development Bank, you have been the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for this organization throughout. Um, according to its overall 2022 through 2026 strategy, uh, your organization will direct, quote unquote, 40% of its total financing. Uh, to projects related to climate change. As uh, you know, uh, climate change is the biggest and the most big. important global uh, challenge of our time. Makani, the former Bank of uh, England um, uh, governor, said that it is also the biggest opportunity, the biggest commercial op opportunity. So when we look at climate change, we see this as a strategic endeavor of us helping our countries work towards policies, work towards strategies, towards uh, net zero. As you know, all of our countries have committed themselves to a 2050 target for net zero, in the case of China, 2060. In other words, the country now has to decarbonize, develop new economic strategies to move away from the very sort of uh, fossil fuel intensive growth that we have uh, had. So what we are simply saying as a bank, together with Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, Asia Development Bank, and all the other multilateral banks, we are all committed to use most of our funding. I'm sure in time that 40% will become even bigger. We will no longer build any coal-fired power stations in the future. We will use our financing in such a way that we can help our countries clean up the pollution in the large uh, cities and make our planet more, more livable. Yeah, also on us, much talked about concept is the global south. I believe it is a term first coined by uh, the, the Europeans and the Americans, um, but now it's increasingly adopted by countries, members of the global south. Um, the BRICS leaders have been talking about elevating the status of the global south. Uh, the NDB recently, like you said, have been admitted new members, including Bangladesh, Egypt, the UAE, and Uruguay. Um, why these new countries? So the bank, by design, way back in 2014, when the Articles of Agreement or the treaty was signed by all the heads of state, at that stage already, the ambition was always to create a global bank. So the, the BRICS countries were the founders, but the intention has always been for them to dilute over time and to bring in other, other member countries. But we first needed to build the foundation, if you like, in baby steps. We have now successfully done that. As I said, we have almost 100 projects. We are a real institution with you know, big headquarters in, in uh, Shanghai, uh, very well capitalized, very highly rated at AA and AA+. So we are now able to spread our wings and to, to broaden our, our footprint. So these countries that you have just referenced have already uh, joined, and we look forward to having uh, a, a larger group of, of new countries join in the next uh, few years. Um, what is the, really the urgency, talking to about the, the issue of climate change, um, of multilateral institutions such as yours do something about it? Because we have been experiencing here in Beijing, for example, uh, record heat waves. And also elsewhere, we've seen reports of record heat waves. Climate change is uh, real. I think that there is uh, almost 100% consensus today that the, um, the world needs to find new sustainable growth paths 
as multilateral banks, we see ourselves as part of that, that effort to help our countries navigate these uh, changes. There will only be increases, by the way, in the incidence and severity of uh, climate uh, disasters going uh, forward. We, we take that as fact. What we are doing now is to both look at climate mitigation as well as adaptation and making sure that everything we do, every port we build, every, every power, uh, a new energy source that we bring onto the uh, grid is renewable. Uh, that in every infrastructure road that we construct, that it takes into account the emission uh, intensity uh, factor. Also, I want to ask you about the Chinese economy. We've seen recent figures of the second quarter slowing down, but overall it's been considered steady. Um, what kind of synergy uh, do you see between the Chinese economy and the New Development Bank considering uh, the latest trends and developments uh, within the Chinese economy? I mean, as you know, China has moved, uh, have, have transitioned from what has been rapid growth in the past, like very, very uh, high nominal growth of, you know, 9, 10% uh, for several decades uh, towards a different growth uh, path. There's much more focus now on high quality growth, on the sustainability of that uh, growth, on the sort of disparities between rural and uh, urban how inclusive this uh, growth uh, is. So, so this transition away from that rapid growth was always going to lead to a slow, really slowing down of that uh, nominal GDP uh, number. But as I said, it is much more important to focus on the uh, quality uh, aspects because that growth path was not sustainable into the uh, longer uh, term. Even though China is slowing down, there's a massive rollout of infrastructure. So for us as a bank, together with our peers here in Beijing, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, there's a lot of business to, to be done. The western part of China still requires significant infrastructure, uh, new rail, new airports, new ports. So, so we will be um, uh, investing more in the uh, expansion of that infrastructure rollout in uh, China. China is one of our largest borrowers, the second largest, in fact, within the bank. 24% of our portfolio of $35 billion um, are projects in uh, China. Finally, as the deputy head of the New Development Bank and also as a South African, we've got to ask you about the upcoming BRICS summit taking place in none other than your home country, your expectations. We look forward to the uh, summit. It is a, a you know, the, the BRICS formation is now 15 years old. It's, uh, you know, long enough to do some reflection what has been achieved over the last 15 years and to look at the, the current um, conjuncture and then to look at what comes uh, next. There's very, very high expectations that this is going to be a very successful uh, summit. There's large numbers of heads of state invited from all over Africa and other parts of the world. So it could lead to a expansion of BRICS as a, as a political uh, bloc, and then also out of that, new members potentially joining the New Development Bank. Yeah, we've seen a whole host of countries uh, waiting to be joining this organization. Leslie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.